Good morning, class. Um, I hope everyone's doing fine. Um, we are at the start of uh, time, so and should probably start today's uh, class, even though I don't see that everyone's joined in. Uh, hopefully, people will catch up uh, through the video. Um, in, in any case, I have a few reminders uh, to get things started. Uh, there is the uh, homework, homework two, two is due uh, on Canvas uh, on Thursday. And it involves, and it involves uh, linear models, uh, just like a warm up about what linear separability is. Um, some uh, uh, you know, for math involving exercises about mistake bound model, uh, in particular the halving algorithm. And uh, there, there, there's experiments that involve implementing the perceptron algorithm and some variants on uh, a version of the badges data that we've created. And uh, hopefully all of you have started and uh, uh, maybe some of you are even done. If you have questions, uh, you can we can bring it up today in class or use office hours or uh, you can use Canvas. There's a lot of fun discussion on Canvas already. Uh, so please do take a look and uh, maybe your question's already answered there, or if not, you feel free to ask a question. Uh, another reminder I wanted to uh, bring up is uh, a milestone today for the project. Uh, there's a due date, it should show up on your canvas. You need to just uh, create your Kaggle account connected to, to um, uh, you know, the, to canvas by giving us the, your Kaggle username and also upload a dummy submission that we provide to Kaggle uh, and tell us what uh, uh, what uh, results Kaggle tell you. So before we move on to today's lecture, uh, are there any questions about the homework or the project or any logistics? I see there's a question. Um, so for the project, is it okay to use your Gmail address? Yeah, totally. Uh, uh, it shouldn't matter. All I need is some way to connect your Kaggle account to your uh, um, to what I uh, have access to on Canvas. So yeah, it should be fine. You can give yourself uh, any sort of a name um, uh, or the ID on Kaggle that you want. Um, there's another question. Is it reasonable that for different number of seats, we get a different best learning? And by best learning, I, I'm assuming you mean best uh, learning rate. Is that right? Or is it best uh, best learning rate? So. Yes, uh, it shouldn't vary too much, um, but I don't think uh, I, I don't think it should matter so much uh, that different seeds give you different learning rates. In general, I would suggest don't play around with the random seed too much, simply because it might be tempting. And and let me ex explain a certain temptation that you might have um, inadvertently. You might accidentally try to find a random seed that gives you the best results. Now that is uh, basically trying to find a random number generator that gives you best results, which is nothing more than just gambling. So try not playing too much with the random seed. It's possible that you might get different uh, learning rate or different hyperparameters for different random seeds, because keep in mind, the random seed controls uh, the initialization and also the ordering uh, inside the perceptron algorithm. So uh, all of these things might uh, uh, might make minor differences. So uh, for the homework, there's another question. For the homework, did you talk about the, uh, averaging the weight vector already? Yes, I spoke about it uh, at the end of uh, last Thursday's lecture. If you want, I can revisit it. Um, Today, in fact, I will revisit. I will start off uh, by revisiting that. And if you have any questions about that, you can ask. Are there any other questions? Where should we initialize our random seed? Once at the beginning of the program, or should you initialize it throughout? I strongly recommend you initialize your random seed once at the beginning of your program and never again. Um, th that way. So here's the reason why uh, it's recommended to fix the random seed. You need to, um, uh, you want as much replicability as possible. So you don't want to touch that too much. You just want to set it once um, so that the next person who runs your code 
uh, steps through the exact sequence of things that you have seen. So you don't need to change it. You just need to set it once uh, when at the top of your code and that's about it. Other questions? One thing that I wanted to uh, uh, just highlight, I'm sure you've noticed this already, is the perceptron experiments have a different characteristic, different feel than your decision tree experiments. And even though they, ha they have a similar structure, and I'll spend some time uh, uh, um, towards in the latter uh, half of today's lecture talking about machine learning experiments. So there is a common structure to them, but uh, um, I have been told by students in the past that percept the perceptron uh, and subsequent homeworks tend to be easier than the decision tree homeworks. And uh, uh, one of the reasons for that might be that you're just getting used to this workflow. And this will be a workflow that is going to stick with you for the rest of the semester and hopefully beyond. So if there are no other questions about homework, I'm going to uh, go back to the lecture and I'll, and I'll answer Kristen's uh, question about averaging as we talk about it. So in the last lecture, we looked at the perceptron algorithm. The perceptron algorithm is uh, uh, was introduced, the, at least the simplest version of this algorithm was introduced in this uh, paper by uh, Frank Rosenblatt in about 1957 or 58. Uh, or, uh, and this was the, you know, uh, there are similar ideas existed just before that. Um, the algorithm itself is rather simple. It essentially says, um, you know, just, uh, initialize your weights. This is the um, simple uh, perceptron that doesn't involve multiple epochs or anything like that. You initialize your weights and you iterate through training examples. In each case, you make a prediction. And if the prediction is wrong, you make an update. The update is the famous perceptron update, which says uh, uh, you take your old weights and add a scaled version of the features to the weights. And what should be the scaling factor? It should be the label. So for a positive example, you add the weights. For a negative example, you subtract the weights. This is the simple version of the perceptron algorithm. But in practice, you implement, you might implement a variant of it. Um, uh, so uh, this is a, um, uh, the, 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 what might be called the standard perceptron algorithm or the batch perceptron algorithm, that's the, the more common name though, uh, where you initialize your weight, the same perceptron loop that we saw before exists. Notice that here I have written mistakes slightly differently instead of checking whether y, the sign, y not equal to uh, the prediction y prime, I have written yi w transpose x neg is negative. And this is essentially the same because w transpose x is positive means the prediction is positive. And if for a positive, if the prediction is positive, so if, and I stepped through this in the last lecture, but I want to do it again, because we will need this uh, um, when we talk about the mistake bound theorem. So let's consider four cases. So we, oh, we have true label is plus one and the predict and uh, I think I've... So if the true label is plus one, and then let's say if W transpose X is positive, that means the prediction is positive, so there is no mistake. If the true label is minus one, and the W, the, so the sign of W transpose X is uh, still positive, that means because the sign is positive, the prediction is positive, which means there is a mistake. And then if the true label is plus one, this is negative, and these are the four cases, right? So once again, we have a mistake here because the true label is positive and the sign is negative. And here there is no mistake. So we can compactly write a prediction as this, the product of YW transpose X sorry, product of Y, which is the true label and W transpose X 
is negative. So you have the product is negative here, the product is negative here. In any case, so uh, you do this uh, again and again. Uh, the uh, going back to the batch perceptron algorithm, you, what you get is you iterate through the data multiple times. So you have you iterate through the data multi, in multiple epochs. You initialize your weights only once at the top. You never initialize again. And and inside each epoch, you shuffle the data so that in every epoch you go through the data in a different order, and uh, then you just um, um, uh, apply the perceptron loop. So let's maybe uh, let me look at some questions that you may have. So there is a question about office hours. Um, there's another class. What's the best way to arrange something? Send me an email. Send, send me a message through Canvas, or you can go to the TA's office hours. So there, is there a big difference? So there, ah, there's another question. Is there a big difference uh, if we use strictly less than or less than equal to? In fact, I would argue that this is a mistake. What's on the slide is a mistake. You should use less than equal to. Let's think about what's going on. Oh, actually, no, I, I take it back. So it should be um, less than equal to. So let's let's work through this, okay? So consider what happens in the very first example that this uh, algorithm encounters. And because the weights are zero, in the very first example, W transpose X is zero, right? Which means if you check for, which means Y W transpose X is equal to zero for the very first example. And this is only because the weights are zero. So if you, if you check for, if, if your update criteria condition is update, if y w transpose x is strictly less than zero, then you will never make an update. And why is this happening? Because you initialize your weights to zero. In your homework, it doesn't matter so much because you initialize your weights to a small negative number, as to a, some random, small random numbers. So you will, most likely not get this condition of y w transpose x equals zero. So you will make an update. The problem is if you don't make an update in the first step uh, because of this reason, your weights are still going to remain zero. So in this next example, it will still not make an update. So essentially, if you initialize your weights to zero and your update condition is strictly less than like here, then you will never make any updates. So there's another question. By shuffling the data, should we just could we just shuffle the example rows order in your data set or instance? What's the difference between instance? And I, I, I don't quite understand the question. Could you clarify, Edward? Oh, for instance. Um, yeah, that's that that's what it is. Essentially, you're shuffling the order of the examples. Um, this is what it is. You iterate through the you, you it, it doesn't matter how you implement it. Essentially, the goal here is to ensure that in every epoch, you it, you go through the examples in a different and a random order. Do you initialize the set the initial weights to zero at every epoch? Uh, this was also a question on Canvas, and absolutely not for the following reason. Because think about so, if you, you, the initial weights are assigned at the beginning of learning and everything inside this is the learning uh, loop. We will encounter other algorithms which also have essentially a very similar structure. So there's always like a parameter initialization phase and then the initial parameters are thrown into the learning loop and you don't initialize again. At that point, the weights are the parameters are only controlled by the data. And at the end of that loop, the learning uh, is done. Uh, the reason you don't initialize your weights at zero is uh, at the end, at the start of every epoch, is because if you did that, then let's say you initialize your weights to zero here, then what would happen is you are basically for uh, forgetting, forcing the algorithm to forget everything that it learned here in the previous epoch. Because once you go back here, you are resetting the weights to zero, so you don't want that to happen. So this is the standard perceptron algorithm. In, then we, in the last lecture, we also looked at a certain variant of the perceptron algorithm called average perceptron. The average perceptron looks something like this. It's essentially the same as your perceptron algorithm, except for two differences, three differences, really. There's one more, which is here. Um, 
and uh, the, the 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 differences involve um, maintaining an average weight vector a in addition to your weight vector the w the update rule is identical if there is a mistake according to your w you update the w this is exactly the same but in addition what you do is whether or not there is a mistake you you keep accumulating the weights into the average vector so whether or not there is a mistake you accumulate uh, w into a now let's think about what this is doing what what's going on here is a weight vector that does not make a mistake gets added into w uh, gets added into a more times so weight vectors that are more correct show up more often inside this accumulation so the average weight vector so this is called the average here i'm just doing the sum if you really want to uh, go by the name at the end you should divide uh, you should uh, divide a by the number of uh, times you have gone through the data but uh, more weight vectors that are more correct that have su have survived longer without updates are represented more inside this average weight vector and this is the weight uh, weights that you return at the end and the final prediction will be using the average weights rather than the w so this w is an internal thing for the learner but it never exposes that outside does this is, uh, answer your question kristen and we looked at the motivation for why this should be done at the end of the or why this is a reasonable idea at the end of the previous lecture the intuition is you don't want to accidentally um, throw out uh, a, a weight vector that has survived for many many examples without an update just because of some noise that came along at the very last stage for example so there's another question should the initial average weight vector be zeros or random numbers i would suggest just keep it zeros uh, simply because uh, you want to average um, the a is supposed to be the average in practice though if you initialize it with a small random number and you run enough number of epochs um for a large enough data set the initialization will get uh, overwritten quite uh, quite a bit because you keep accumulating but uh, in the interest of uh, being safe why do you uh, you you don't want to uh, initialize it to anything so you add your weights to the average vector when so there's a question you add the weights to the average vector ah i see this uh, so this whole thing is inside the for loop so at the not at the end of every epoch not when there's an update but every single time you look at an example whether or not you make an update you add the weights so let me write the same thing i uh, i see that i'm using indentation as a cue for when things should uh, happen um uh, so let me just rewrite the same thing using uh, um curly brackets to indicate scope so your average perceptron might look something like this uh, like this so first oh this i see that the font is small so first you um initialize uh w and a to zero and then you do something like this for epoch in in one for as many epochs that you have let's say let's use curly brackets to make sure that everything is clear now in first you shuffle the data and then for x comma y in the data and again if y w transpose x is 0 this is this is just the update and then whether or not you make an update you say a is a plus w you end this thing and this thing this is one this is two so 
you don't uh, you uh, so the important thing this is a common bug that people may have uh, so i want to re emphasize this point you update your average weights irrespective of whether an update happens or not second you update your average weights inside the innermost loop so for every example whether or not there's an update you update your average weights and the third bug that happens um, often is people there are two more bugs with average perceptron that people have in their code, so just watch out for this. The, this check is done using W. This, every, all these updates are done using W, but the final weights that are returned are A. A mistake that people do is they use uh, A for checking there, and that uh, basically is uh, not the right algorithm. So there was another question, uh, uh, is this an average? So does this answer your question, Jordan, by the way? Or not Jordan, who asked about uh, uh, Brett? And uh, the question, ah, so, uh, so the, the, there's a question about dividing and the answer is uh, what uh, is written in the chat. Basically your, uh, uh, we only care about the sign. That's why we don't really worry about uh, dividing. If you want to really, really be precise with the name, you should divide this by uh, T times the size of the data set. But uh, it doesn't matter. And it's just one more thing to do. And it should, it's a constant, it doesn't matter. It's just, a, it's a positive number, so it doesn't really matter. Are you allowed to have a non-zero bias term in the average perceptron? Um, Yes, of course. Uh, they, I mean, implicitly here, there is always a bias term. So W contains a bias term because remember, you're adding an extra. Um, so there are two ways in which you can handle the bias term. So either you can add an extra feature, in which case that ex the average perceptron will also contain that extra uh, bias element. The average uh, weights will also contain the extra bias. Or you explicitly have a bias, in which case you need to, if you explicitly have a bias, then you have bias for the weights and then the bias for the average vector. You update uh, the bias for the weights here and you update the bias for the average here. And you basically, uh, update is literally just adding. So BA becomes BA plus BW and then you return BW. And now you might uh, notice that there's so much bookkeeping, which is why I strongly recommend you extend your feature by, you always add an extra feature to all every training example, which always has the value one. And this will just uh, uh, take care of this. So it, does the homework want you to use the bias explicitly? Is that right? Uh, I don't remember anymore. Can one of my, we can maybe uh, uh, move this thing to uh, canvas so that I don't have to look up things right now. I, I don't remember if the homework wants, oh, does it? Yeah, okay, so the homework does, it looks like the homework does want you to use the bias term explicitly. So you will have uh, what I just said then, um, yeah. So you will have a extra update here for the bias, which is uh, I think written in the homework. You will have an extra update here for the average bias, which is also written in the homework. And don't forget to return the bias term at the end. Okay, so going back, so you have, this is the average perceptron. So the important thing here is the, okay, there's also a few other variants of perceptron that we looked at. Uh, in particular, we looked at the margin perceptron last week, um, which just says, uh, instead of checking for Y W transpose X is uh, less than equal to zero, you check whether it's less than equal to some small positive number eta. The intuition is imagine that this is a hyperplane that separates the current hyperplane and uh, negative examples are on this side. So this side is positive. YW transpose X is less than zero means a positive example shows up on this side or a negative example shows up on this side, both of which are wrong. But less than eta says a positive example shows up on the correct side, but it's very close to the margin. So there is essentially what you're doing is creating this band around the hyperplane and saying, if a positive example shows up here, or if a negative example shows up here, it's still wrong. If, it, if a positive example shows up on the correct side of the hyperplane, but is too close to the boundary, 
then you still penalize it so that you get a little bit of extra margin of safety. So that's why we uh, uh, think uh, this is this was the perceptron algorithm. The perceptron algorithm was uh, uh, defined as we know it today in uh, in the 1950s, and something remarkable happened um, almost immediately. So the the paper was published in uh, 1958. And almost immediately in 1958, by the end of the year, there was an incredible hype about this algorithm. And uh, the New York Times, for example, started talking about things like uh, the Navy revealing an, uh, an electronic computer that, can the, that will soon be able to walk, talk, see, write, and reproduce, and be conscious of its existence. Um, this is similar to the kind of hype that we see with the uh, uh, machine learning today, and that's why I wanted to bring this up. Um, the this was the, the other the thing to keep in mind is this algorithm was implemented uh, on the IBM 704. The IBM 704 is a computer that most of us may not recognize as a computer today. It looks something like this, uh, and. This was a time when there was like an incredible amount of hype about the perceptron algorithm, but just like there's a lot of hype about uh, AI and the bad news was basically it didn't live up to the hype. I mean, of course, the computer was uh, uh, the, the perceptron algorithm, the simple algorithm that keeps updating its weights and rotating a hyperplane was did not learn to read or grow wiser. And as a result, it led to what is known as an AI winter. Basically, funding was pulled off for artificial intelligence research, um, in particular because of something that we'll see in a bit, uh, because of a book uh, that basically showed that the perceptron, the perceptron being a linear classifier cannot represent the XOR function. And suddenly people were like, if it can't even recognize XOR, then how can it learn to read and grow wise? And this was a, uh, there's a lesson in there somewhere about uh, exaggeration, uh, but I want you to keep this simple algorithm in mind. This is all the perceptron algorithm is. You shuffle the data, and if there's a mistake, you make an update by adding the weighted examples to the sorry the um, the uh, adding the features with the correct sign to the weights. What you need to know as far as this. Uh, uh, this unit is concerned is you need to know the perceptron algorithm and uh, its variants, at least the ones that you encounter in your homework. You need to understand the geometry of the update and we went through this in the last lecture. And you need to know what kinds of things the perceptron can represent. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a simple answer. The perceptron uh, can represent linearly separable functions because it's, uh, it learns a linear classifier. So starting with, uh, so let's move on to the main theme of today's lecture, which is the perceptron mistake bound. So we've already seen the algorithm and its variants. It's not enough to just write an algorithm and say that, uh, okay, trust me, it works. We need some sort of a proof that uh, this is actually a valid algorithm. There are two kinds of uh, convergence results around the perceptron algorithm. We'll see one of them in a lot of detail and I can point you to references if you want uh, to look at the second one. The first result is the convergence theorem. The convergence theorem, which we will prove in full detail, says that if there is a set of weights that are consistent with your data, that is if your data is linearly separable, then your perceptron algorithm will converge. And by perceptron here, it's a simple perceptron, uh, which is like the online version of the perceptron. So it's the one where you keep getting an infinite stream of examples and uh, um, the, uh, the thing keeps making uh, updates if necessary. What the convergence theorem is saying is if the data that you have is linearly separable, in other words, if the true concept that labels the examples is a linearly separable concept, then the perceptron algorithm will stop making mistakes. And we'll see uh, why, this, uh, you know, why this is true. There's also the cycling theorem which says if the training data is not linearly separable, then the learning algorithm will uh, eventually repeat the same set of weights uh, over a period of time. It will enter an infinite loop. So it will essentially never converge. It will keep making mistakes. Um, so 
let's maybe think a little bit about perceptron learnability. Um, the perceptron, of course, can only represent linearly separable functions. So we are only talking about linearly separable functions. Um, there was an influential book from 1969 called Perceptrons uh, that uh, was actually, it's actually a fascinating book that talks about how to analyze these things from a geometrical perspective. And uh, uh, it, uh, it showed among other things that parity functions cannot be learned by the perceptron. We know why it can't be learned by the perceptron because parity in XOR functions are not linearly separable. The perceptron algorithm can only learn linearly separable things. So of course it's not going to learn. Um, and this means that, uh, and the argument went at that time, this means that uh, it cannot represent things like symmetry, which is inherently uh, a parity. So this was a big limitation and this is what led to uh, people becoming disenchanted with perceptrons specifically and also neural networks uh, uh, in the early 70s. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, learnability and talk about how um, uh, the perceptron algorithm will work. But uh, before that, just so that, just to make sure that we are all on the same page, um, I'm going to, I would like to launch a poll on just to kind of make you think about what, when the perceptron algorithm makes an update. So the question um, is, suppose you have, and you know, you should be able to answer this, uh, the poll should be visible. Suppose you have your, the weights are one, one, and there's no bias term. Pick which of these four examples uh, will the perceptron uh, make an update? And it says multiple choice, but I'm gonna make your life easy. There's only one correct answer here. Um, and uh, the way you need to work through this is you need to take the dot product of the weights and X, and see if uh, the sign of that matches Y. So th this is a useful exercise because you will, uh, uh, this will kind of get you thinking about when the perceptron will and will not make updates. So in the meanwhile, uh, while you are answering this poll, uh, let me look at a question. If the data is not linearly separable, but close to linearly separable, does perceptron converge to that close thing? Um, Perhaps yes. No, we don't. Uh, I can't think of an immediate proof for just the online perceptron, but uh, the batch version of the perceptron that you're implementing in your homework has that tendency, and we will see why that will happen when we talk about learning uh, as an optimization problem, uh, where we will uh, uh, frame learning as optimization, and we will talk about what that close thing means. So the batch perceptron does what uh, you ask. Um, so once again, looking at the poll, uh, about um, 70, 70 to eighty percent of you have answered, and that has been my usual threshold for stopping the poll so that we can discuss it. So, uh, okay, that's exactly eighty percent. I'm going to end the poll and then show the results. And uh, um, uh, unless maybe there are still some of you waiting to answer, maybe not. So. Most of you have said uh, the answer is the third one, which is, I think, the right answer. So I would like to work through all four cases just to make sure that everyone is uh, on the same page. And this is something that's uh, worth working through. So what you have is your current weight is one comma one, and the bias is zero. Uh, the prediction is the sign of W transpose X plus B, which is, I can write this as the sign of W1 X1 plus W2 X2 plus B. B is zero, so we can ignore that. So let's maybe look at one example at a time. So for the example that is X equals one comma one, you have W transpose X plus B is um, two, which is greater than or equal to zero. So the prediction is plus one. And the ground truth is also a plus one. So we are good. So there's no update. Uh, so for X equals say minus one comma minus one, 
W transpose X plus B is minus two, which is less than zero, which means the prediction is minus one. The ground truth is also minus one. So there's no problem. There's no update. The third example is X is three comma zero, which means W transpose X plus B is three times the weight one. So the three times this plus zero times this. So it is three which is greater than zero, which means the prediction is one, but the ground truth is minus one. So this example will cause an update. So the, home, the question says the ground truth is minus one. So uh, this example will cause an update. And we have the fourth case, which is three zero. And which means W transpose X plus B is three, which is greater than zero. And which is exactly the same as before. Ground truth is uh, the same as the prediction. So there is no update. So, uh, the this is uh, the, I mean the, the, this is a rather simple example, but it's worth uh, working through these kinds of simple examples just to make sure that uh, things are clear. So there are a few other questions. Uh, can you explain why the number of epo uh, why the number of epochs? Uh, so as the number of epochs grows, the perceptron does not necessarily uh, become more and more accurate. Why should this happen? The answer is as the number of epochs grows, the uh, uh, the perceptron tends to overfit. This is this will be true for most uh, learning algorithms. If you if the, if you will as the number of epochs grows, you will you the, remember that the the data need not be linearly separable, so it might end up overfitting some accidental correlations in the data. Uh, we will encounter uh, once again to kind of get an intuition for why this is happening we will uh, have to think about learning as optimization so we'll come back to that but the answer is it is uh, essentially overfitting it's uh, uh, as the 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 intuition uh, which may or may not be helpful is something like this as you run the algorithm for more epochs you are the more uh, the more time you spend uh, um, uh, as as the, as the number of epochs increases the the learner is encouraged to remember the training set more and more. He's encouraged to make fewer mistakes on the training set. And as a result, it's overfitting. So uh, we'll see a for, uh, some uh, a slightly more formal version of this argument later on. Uh, what's the difference between the batch perceptron and the online perceptron? The online perceptron is the version that we first encountered. The online perceptron is the version that uh, is from Rosenblatt. Um, so let's see. Um, this thing here, where there is no notion of multiple epochs through the data. The batch perceptron is the one that you're implementing in the homework. It's the one where you uh, let the uh, algorithm go through multiple epochs. So this is also called batch. So that's the, the, the big difference between online and batch is that in, an on, in a batch algorithm, you are given a fixed data set and, the go, and you're asked your learner is asked to do whatever it can to produce a model. And typically most batch algorithms, not all, the decision tree algorithm is a counter example, but most batch algorithms tend to iterate through the data again and again. The decision tree kind of divides and conquers uh, the ID3 algorithm. But most batch algorithms have a fixed data set that goes into some learner and you get a classifier at the end. In the online version of the, uh, the algorithm, you don't have a fixed data set, you have an infinite stream of examples that keep coming in. The version of the perceptron that was introduced by Rosenblatt was online. The version that we will analyze is online. The version that you implement is the batch version. So in general, um, uh, there's another question, would it make sense to choose the number of epochs as a hyperparameter instead of choosing the number of epochs with the highest accuracy? Uh, I've seen both being done. Usually the number of epochs, so there's a tiny, you know, actually uh, Ben, I'll come back to this question at the end of the uh, lecture after seeing the theorem. But the short answer is um, usually the number of epochs is chosen by looking at accuracy, not on the training set, but a separate held out set called the validation set so that you don't overfit the number of epochs on the training set. Um, it, I have seen it being chosen as a hyperparameter, but it's a slightly problematic hyperparameter to use uh, cross validation for, so typically people don't do that. All right, so let's uh, go back to the mistake bound. An important concept in understanding the mistake bound is this notion called the margin. 
the margin is an idea that we will encounter today for the first time but uh, we will re revisit a few times as the semester goes along um so let's uh, look at um, uh, what a margin is so the margin for a hyperplane of a hyperplane with respect to a single data set is simply the distance of the closest point to the hyperplane so you can measure the distance of every single point and find which one is the closest and that distance is the margin so this is a property of a hyperplane and a data set it's simply saying how close is this hyperplane to some example and i'm assuming here that this hyperplane this line perfectly classifies the data so i'm um, in given that the line perfectly classifies the data how close is it to some example so the uh, the line on the screen has a higher margin than say something like this because this line is so close to the negative example but the more interesting notion is the margin of a certain data set which is uh, uh, the greek letter gamma is used to denote that the margin of a data set is the maximum possible margin on any single any weight vector that could exist so you try i mean the, the naive way of finding the maximum margin is you try putting lines uh, in this separating region all possible lines and find the distance for each one of them and then find the line that has the highest uh, margin so the margin you can imagine that the margin of a data set is a property that tells you how difficult the data set is so a data set that has a larger margin has a bigger gap between the positive and the negative examples and as a result you might even accidentally find a good weight vector a separating weight vector because there's more room this is the intuition of the margin the margin the larger the margin the more room there is to separate out the positive and the negative examples the smaller the margin the less room there is this is up to scale we are assuming that uh, the points are all scaled in some way so this is uh, 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 in, uh, the margin of a data set can be thought of as a complexity parameter that determines how difficult this data set is so this was this is a key technical point that uh, the, the, the technical concept that we need in order to understand how uh, the perceptron algorithm the online version converges so before we uh, move on to the theorem i would like to pause for questions about the margin simply because this is an idea that we will encounter multiple times and so i want to make sure that uh, uh, you are clear about it so are there any questions about the margin is there a formal definition so yes there is a formal definition we will uh, so in fact i can write it for you right now so the margin of a hyperplane so uh, yeah so first of all let me answer donovan's question first uh, the margin cannot be uh, a negative thing uh, let me write down the formal definition so let's say what's the distance of the hyper given a hyperplane w and so let's say we have a data set d which consists of pairs x comma y the distance of a uh, of a, an example x from the hyperplane is simply w transpose x divided by the norm of w and the absolute value of that so let's actually you know what let me write this in a new page rather than crowding this place so given given a data set d which consists of examples x comma y so the distance of a, 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 a hyperplane from i'm i'm assuming that there, there are no uh, uh, the the bias term is not there and uh, we've talked about that before so given the distance of the uh, the example from this weight vector is simply the absolute value of w transpose x divided by the norm of um, w 
So among all the examples that we have, we can ask the closest, so the distance of the closest point is simply the minimum among, among all this, minimum among all x. By the way, I'll not say why, but you can think about this. This is, if the data is linearly separable, this is exactly the same as y w transpose x divided by the norm of w. Minimum over x comma y of the absolute value of w transpose x divided by the norm of w. So among all the distances, we find the smallest one. So the margin of D, which is simply gamma is defined to be the, so this is among all weight vectors, find the weight vector that has the largest distance. So I want to maximize over all W this thing here. This is closest point to W, which is exactly the same as maximize over all W, minimize over all X comma Y in the data, W transpose X divided by the norm of W, the absolute value of that. So this is the full formal Gori definition. If this helps, I'm very happy. If it doesn't help, uh, don't worry about it. The, in, the, the I, I think the intuition is you search for all hyperplanes, find the one that, uh, that gives the maximum gap between the positive and the next example, between to the closest example. I hope this is helpful. Um, so th the next question, there are a few other questions and the let me just go through it again. The margin cannot be a negative value. Uh, for a larger margin, uh, it's actually mo not more difficult, la the larger, so, okay, this is an interesting question. Thomas asks, does this mean a larger margin is more difficult to solve for because there could be more lines that we could use? Actually, it's the exact opposite. I don't care about finding, uh, as far as the perceptron is concerned, all I want is to find a line that correctly classifies. So going back to the picture, the larger margin would mean that there is more room in this space to find a line and any one of them is okay. So I might be, I, be, there are more number of correct answers so I can accidentally stumble on a correct answer. The margin in some sense tells you how many, how much space there is to find the correct answer. There's more room to find one if your margin is larger. What do you mean by any weight vector? That's another question. Uh, is it any weight vector encountered during training? No, this is any weight vector that exists. We, we are not talking about training. The margin of a data set is a property of the data set. It's not with respect to a certain algorithm. It's just a property of the data set. The perceptron algorithm, importantly, does not maximize the margin. The algorithm that actually does maximize the margin is the support vector machine. We will encounter that uh, after we see learning theory. If the margin of the data set tells us, uh, how, if the margin of the data set is to tell us about the room we have, then shouldn't we be thinking about the minimum of all possible margins? Not quite. So let's maybe look at a picture again. So uh, imagine that you have a data set that looks like this. So the maximum margin line might be going somewhere bang in the middle of the positive of the negatives. So it might, you know, this quantity here is higher and equal to this quantity, it's equal to this quantity there and uh, it's higher than everything else. Let's look at some other lines that have less margin. So here is a line that has, has a lower gap. It's really close to the positive and the negative examples. In fact, I can take this to an extreme. Here is another line that has an even less. It goes through the thing. This means that, you know, just if there's a little bit of noise in that, in that region, then the example will be incorrectly classified. The two black lines have lower margin than the blue line. And the intuition is we want to find the line that is uh, as far away from the positive and the negative points as possible and still tries to separate the 
theta. This is the notion of a maximum margin. We won't be getting there for uh, uh, until we come to SVM. For now, all you need to know is that the margin of the data is this gap here, and the larger the margin, uh, it, 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 well, it's a function of that gap there, and the larger the margin, the easier the data set is. So the definition of the margin, of course, applies only to linearly separable functions, uh, linearly separable data sets. So given this definition, we can now start to look at the mistake bound theorem. The perceptron mistake bound theorem was almost uh, uh, so simultaneously the, uh, invented or discovered, I'm not sure, by two people, Novikov and Bloch. So this theorem is called the Novikov theorem or the Novikov Bloch theorem. Um, so let's step through the theorem first before we look at the proof. Suppose you have a se sequence of examples, x1, y1, x2, y2. Uh, these are training examples such that every example is uh, um, some n-dimensional, uh, uh, every example is an n-dimensional vector. So it's a, uh, in the, we have n features. And more importantly, every example the length of, so because we are talking about an example as an n-dimensional point, we can think of the length of the vector. The norm of that vector is the thing, is uh, the length of that vector. Every example has a length less than or equal to r. And of course, we are talking about a binary classification problem, which means the uh, uh, labels are minus one or plus one. The nothing here is really new, except for this one point about uh, the length, the norm of xi, every example has a norm less than or equal to i. The way to think about that is you have a collection of points and let's say in two dimensions, this is the origin and say I have, oh, I should have I should have drawn this a little bit more carefully. So let's say I have the origin here and let's say I have positives and say negatives on this side. Now, this condition that says the length, the the length of every example is less than or equal to r is saying that there is some r. So for every example, I can ask how far is it from the origin? This is saying there's some r such that every example is inside, the, inside that circle with radius r. So my circle is really not well centered here, but you can imagine if this is r, every example, there's this gigantic ball that contains every point that will ever show up. And that ball has the radius r. This is not uh, particularly a, a, a shocking thing to assume. All you are saying is that the farthest point, in this case, it may be this point is the farthest point, um, is uh, at, a, at a distance of r. So you just look for the farthest data point from the origin and call its distance r. This is uh, just a definition that we have. Now, next, Suppose you have a unit vector, u. u is a unit uh, uh, n-dimensional vector. Uh, in other words, the length of u is one, such that for every example in the data, there exists some gamma, which is positive, such that for every example you have, uh, y w transpose x is greater than that number. Y w transpose x being greater than, than Gamma means that example is correctly classified according to this weight vector u. And not only is it correctly classified, the margin of the data is gamma. So for every example, this weight vector puts it on the correct side of the weight, uh, of the weight as per the label, not just the correct side, but at a distance of gamma away. So this means that not only is the data separable, it has a margin of gamma. If this happens, then the theorem says the perceptron algorithm will make no more than R square over gamma square mistakes on the training sequence. It doesn't matter what the training sequence is. It doesn't matter if it's an adversary who's putting together the examples, the perceptron algorithm will stop making mistakes after making these many mistakes. This is the perceptron mistake bound theorem. If you want to kind of uh, read between the lines, what it's, by the way, um, uh, the reason for the unit vector is, uh, um, I see that this, there's a mistake here, ignore this. Can ignore this here. Um, so, okay, there is, the, I see that there's some, uh, I thought I got all the 
font errors, but it looks like I missed one. Basically, if you don't have a unit vector there, then you will have a scaling factor in the mistake bound. So there will be some term here that, uh, that divides the mistake bound. So you, will, you can, it's a simple exercise. You can prove it afterwards. But what the mistake bound theorem is saying is, suppose you have a binary classification data set with n dimensional inputs. If the data is linearly separable, then the perceptron algorithm will find a separating hyperplane after making only a finite number of mistakes. It doesn't matter how much data you have. It doesn't matter what your, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether there's an adversary who's carefully ordering the examples that forces the algorithm to make mistakes. The mistake bound theorem says the perceptron algorithm will not make more than a finite number of mistakes, even though uh, related to the point that came up during our mistake bound uh, lecture, even though the problem we have involves real value features and the, hyper, uh, the hypothesis space is continuous and it involves real numbers, doesn't matter, there are only a finite number of mistakes we made. So this is the perceptron mistake bound theorem. What we're going to do uh, for the rest of today's lecture is to prove this theorem. This is a, a rather simple proof. Um, there are like a few steps that you have to be careful about, but it's a rather simple proof. So we're gonna look at a proof of this theorem. Just to make sure that we are all on the same page, the algorithm that we are working with is this thing here. It will remain there at the top of the slide. It is this online algorithm, which remember, it has a few steps. Every online algorithm receives an example. It makes a prediction. In this case, the prediction is the sign of w, y, w transpose, uh, sign of w transpose x. If the prediction is wrong, it makes an update. And the update is the perceptron update. Um, to make the proof work, uh, to simplify things a little, we're going to assume that the initial weight vector is zeros. We're going to assume that the learning rate is one. Notice that uh, there is no learning rate here. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It scales the input, but it doesn't change the global behavior uh, uh, because the initial learning rate is, uh, initial weight factor is zero. We're going to assume that all examples are contained in a ball of size R. What that means is you consider all the data points. Like if you are willing to uh, think about your data points being uh, in some high dimensional space, you draw this gigantic ball that tightly contains all the points. And the radius of that circle or sphere is R. So the norm of every Xi that we will ever encounter is assumed to be less than or equal to R. And more importantly, the training data we are going to assume is separable by a margin gamma according to a unit vector W. What that means is for every example, in the data, um, the um, uh, we have y w transpose y u transpose x is greater than or equal to gamma. Importantly, we don't have we we don't have an assumption that uh, uh, we know the uh, vector u. We assume that we know gamma, but we are not going to actually the mistake bound itself does not contain the vector u. So. Uh, this is just an existence. We assume there exists a weight vector u that separates the data with the margin gamma. Uh, so this is the setup and we're going to work through the proof now. Um, the, there are a few, there's a clarification question. The online algorithm always uses a learning rate of one. That's not quite right. The online algorithm can use a fixed, uh, can use a learning rate of something else, of R. The theorem that we are proving assumes a learning rate of one. The batch algorithm, might have a different learning rate, yes. The online algorithm also can have a different learning rate. We are just assuming for the sake of simplicity that the learning rate is one because that will make this theorem easier to prove. All right, so let's look at the proof. The proof goes in three steps and uh, each of these is a lemma, but I'm to avoid calling it a lemma, I'm just gonna call it a claim. The first claim is that after making T mistakes, so after making the mistake, this, the dot product between u and wt is going to be more than t gamma. So u is some vector here and wt is a weight vector. So u is a unit vector, wt is something like this. 
the dot product, remember, is somehow related to the cosine of the angle. So, and the cosine gets larger and larger means this weight vector is getting closer and closer. So this uh, claim says, as learning proceeds, after making T mistakes, the weight vector, the WT, uh, its dot product with the ground truth, the true vector that we are that we know separates the data will be more than T gamma. To prove that, let's look at one update. So first of all, we know that WT is updated after the teeth mistake. It's updated in this fashion that's written here. So WT becomes WT plus one by adding Y W transpose X. Y, sorry, Y times X. We can ask, what is the dot product of U and W? The dot product of U and W is because WT plus one is constructed by WT plus Y X I. The dot product is simply, uh, you're multiplying U throughout. So it's exactly this term. But notice that uh, we know that the data is linearly separable. Not only is it linearly separable, we know that y, u is going to give it a margin of gamma. So u yi, u transpose xi, by definition, is going to be at least gamma. The data is separable by a margin gamma. So what we have here is this sort of a, uh, um, uh, uh, we've set up a simple recursion here. So this quantity u times wt plus one is greater than or equal to u times wt plus gamma. But u times u, the dot product of u and wt itself, u transpose wt is greater than or equal to using a sim the same argument, wt minus one plus gamma and so on. But we also know that w zero is zero. So which means u times w zero is zero. So just applying induction tells you that we are adding, uh, every time we make an update, this quantity is inc growing by at least gamma. So after T updates, it will be at least T gamma. So that takes care of our first step. So after T mistakes, the, the dot product of U, the uh, a true vector that separates the data and WT, the thing that the algorithm is learning is at least T gamma. So that's the first step. The second claim is, uh, so before we go into the second claim, let me now uh, launch into this discussion about what is a dot product. So a dot product, you can think of it as, um, so I, this is stuff that you must have seen, I don't know, in fifth grade or something, but if you have a vector A dot B, which is in our class, in this class, we are always writing it as A transpose B, is nothing but the length of A times, oh, I see the font is too small, is the length of A times the length of B times the cosine of the angle between them. So you have a vector A of this kind and a vector B, you have the angle between them, and this is the definition of a dot product. Now, let's say that instead of A, you have U, here and W. So what does it mean to say these two vectors are the same? It means that the dot product is zero. Sorry, the dot product is uh, not zero. Sorry, the dot product is zero when they are at 90 degrees. So if you have two vectors that are at 90 degrees that are orthogonal to each other, then the dot product is zero. And if two vectors are pointing in the same direction, then the dot product is as high as it can be but there's still this length of the vector to worry about. So the first claim showed that after T steps, U times the dot product of WT is going to be T gamma. Basically after making T mistakes, this quantity is going to get higher and higher. After making more mistakes, this dot product is getting higher and higher. So the weight vector W is going closer and closer, but there's a problem here. This quantity is getting higher and higher but it could get high because of two reasons. Maybe the angle is reducing, that's why the dot product is going up. So this thing is getting higher. Or remember, uh, so applying the, the dot product of 
u times wt is simply the length of u times the length of wt times the cosine of the angle. This quantity is equal to one, so we can ignore that. So what the first claim showed is this is getting higher and higher as the number of mistakes grow. But the, it can get higher because of two reasons. Either this quantity is going up or this quantity is going up. If the second term is going up, that means the angle between the vectors is the two vectors are getting closer and closer in uh, angle. But how do we know that that's happening? Maybe it's just that the vector is growing longer and longer. And as a result, this dot product is getting higher. Does this make sense? This is just the intuition of why, how we're going to work the proof. So the first claim shows just that the dot product is going up. The second claim will show that, sure, the dot product is going up, but actually the length of W is not going up. In fact, it's uh, uh, reducing, which means the only thing left is that the angle should go up. Sorry, the angle should go down, the cosine goes up. So that's the second claim. The second claim is after t mistakes, the length of w square, the norm of w square is going to be less than t r square. That's also an easy step. All you have to do is think about how w came into existence. w t plus one came into existence because there was a mistake. What happened when there was a mistake? So w t plus one came, was defined to be using again, the same thing here. It is w t plus y i x i. So the length of that thing squared is simply the length of this thing squared. But I can now open up the square. So this is w square plus xi square plus two y w transpose x. Now well, let's examine this a little bit more carefully. Why did this update happen? The update happened because there was a mistake. What does it mean when there's a mistake? It means y w transpose x is negative. So this quantity is negative, right? Second thing, by assumption, this quantity is less than r squared. So the middle term disappears because that the reason we even triggered this update from wt to wt plus one is because this quantity was negative. Otherwise, wt would not have been updated at all. So the way it is updated only when there's a mistake, when there's a mistake, so y w transpose x is negative. And by definition, the length of the vector is less than r. So this quantity is uh, less than or equal to r square. So we can put these two th things together. This term disappears. This term becomes less than or equal to r square. And the equality becomes an inequality. So what we have is that wt plus 1 square is less than or equal to wt square plus r square. But wt square will be less than wt minus 1 square plus r square. It keeps going down till w0 but we know that W zero is zero. And there are only T steps because we have only made T mistakes, which means W T square is less than or equal to T R square. There's a bug in the slide. So this is the correct thing. So W T square is less than or equal to T R square. So this is the second claim. Going back to this uh, uh, picture that I was trying to build up. Because, so let's maybe think about this again. So the dot product of u and wt is exactly this quantity here. The first claim says that uh, u transpose wt is going to be greater than or equal to t gamma. The second claim says the length of wt square is less than or equal to t r square. This quantity, this quantity here is decreasing, but this quantity is increasing which means the only thing that's left is this quantity here, which is also, which has to increase. Otherwise, this equality cannot possibly hold. If the cosine of the angle increases, then the weight get, keeps getting better and better. So, the, yeah, so the, the, this, you're right. So there's a question, if T keeps increasing, then the length of W might keep increasing. It does not grow unboundedly. That's the intuition. Yeah, you're right. So the question is, if t keeps increasing, the length of this is not exactly correct. This the the second inequality simply says this term does not grow uh, as much as uh, as fast as um, uh, in order to keep up with this. And we will see that 
uh, formally a little bit more uh, right now. So just to uh, keep track of where we are, after T mistakes, U transpose WT is greater than or equal to T gamma. After T max mistakes, WT square is less than or equal to T R square. Let's put these two things together. The second term, um, I can just take the square root and flip the, you know, change the order of the inequality. So R times square root of T is greater than or equal to WT, the norm of WT. So that's easy. But the norm of WT is greater than or equal to U transpose WT. Why is that? U transpose WT is equal to the length of U times the length of WT times the cosine. But the length of U is one and the cosine is less than one, which means this quantity, this inequality, U, time, U transpose WT is less than or equal to the length of WT. Uh, those of you who have seen this with another name might recognize as the uh, famous Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, but you don't have to think about that if, you, if, if you've not seen it before. So the length of WT is greater than or equal to U transpose WT. But we know something about U transpose WT. U transpose WT is greater than or equal to T gamma. That comes from here. This is this inequality, this is this thing, and uh, the middle one is because of uh, the properties of dot products. So let's now look at these two terms together. So I have R times, so R times square root of T is greater than or equal to T gamma. I can take, I can square both sides. So R square T is greater than or equal to T square gamma square, cancel out one of the T, move the gamma down. So I get T less than or equal to R square divided by gamma square. But remember, t was the number of mistakes you can make. The left-hand side, t, can potentially grow. It's t is the number of mistakes you make, but the right-hand side is a constant. r is a fixed number. Gamma is also a fixed number. What this means is that the number of mistakes stops. t stops after, making, after reaching this threshold. So this is a bound on the total number of mistakes, according to the Poisson-Prun algorithm. Um, let me pause for questions and I can pull up the, uh, the mistake bound theorem once again, and I'll go over the theorem as you're thinking or typing questions. So the mistake bound theorem says, given a sequence of examples, x1, x2, x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on, where every example is some n-dimensional data point and every feature vector is bounded by R on top and the labels are minus one or plus one, Suppose this is the uh, uh, set of examples we have. If the data, if the true concept has the property that it is linearly separable, in other words, there is some unit vector u such that it has a margin of at least gamma. It has a margin of gamma. What that means is every single example that we will ever encounter will be correctly classified and not just correctly classified, but put at a uh, distance of at least gamma from this hyperplane with parameter zero. If this happens, then the Poisson-Prun algorithm will find, will stop making mistakes after R square over gamma square mistakes on any training sequence. The number of mistakes cannot grow. This is a remarkable statement if you think about it. There is absolutely no, uh, assumption about the order in which the examples are produced. It doesn't matter if an adversary organizes the examples. The, if nature is bound by the fact that the data is linearly separable, the perceptron algorithm will uh, converge. It doesn't matter. I mean, assu uh, 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 assuming there's no noise and such things, but noise can be seen as a nonlinearity. The perceptron algorithm will converge and nature doesn't get to control um, anything uh, after, after the algorithm makes R square over gamma square mistakes. So where is R defined? R is defined right here actually. R is defined as the radius of the ball that contains all the examples. So every example is contained inside the ball of size, um, um, less than equal, uh, a ball of radius less than equal to R. In the simple perceptron, are we setting the margin to zero? The bound for mistakes would not make sense. I don't, we, we don't get to set the margin. This is something that is uh, uh, worth thinking about. 
we don't get to control the margin. The margin is a property of a data set. Some data sets are easier or think instead of data set, think task. Some tasks are easier and as a result, they have a smaller margin. Some learning tasks are harder and they have a larger margin. It's not a property that we get to control. Uh, it's just a property of the data. Just like, uh, you know, we may not be able to control the, the radius, the, the, the size, the radius of the ball that contains the data. If the margin is big, it is easier to learn. Yes, because if gamma is large, then this quantity is small. So the perceptron algorithm will stop making mistakes after a small number of mistakes. So did I say, maybe I did. So I, 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 yeah, I, if the margin is big, the, the, the data set is easier to learn. That's always the case. I, I might have misspoken before, but it, the larger margins correspond to easier learnability. So does this mean uh, that we consider, so there is a question, does this mean we consider a threshold for our estimation, which is gamma? I, we don't get to, most of the time, we, do, we are not in this fortunate situation where we know what the value of gamma is in real life data sets. It's a property of the data that in order to find that property, you have to solve an optimization problem. And along the way, you would have found a separating hyperplane. Um, so it's, this is, I want you to think of this as a proof of concept for why the perceptron algorithm works, but we can't say much more than that. We don't get to control what gamma is. So let me, uh, as you, I mean, we, we will come back to this at the beginning of the next lecture. Um, uh, so R is a property of the dimensionality of the problem. So with, for example, with N features, uh, you should be able to show that R square is n. Uh, the circle here should have been gamma. So gamma is a property of the data. It's a property of the function that uh, uh, that we are thinking of. It is entirely possible that this bound r square or gamma square is uh, is kind of a very loose bound. It's possible that this might uh, be more than the number of data points. But if r square is n, the dimensionality and gamma is a property that let's say is independent of the dimensionality, maybe, maybe not. I don't think it needs to be that way. R square over gamma square is, uh, is order of n, or n square. No, if R square is n, then this goes here. Now, if, if it's order of n, this is polynomial in the dimensionality. So for linearly separable Boolean functions, the perceptron algorithm can stop making mistakes after making a polynomial number of mistakes in the dimensionality. This is the definition of a mistake bound algorithm, which we saw a few uh, last week, I think. So the perceptron algorithm is a mistake bound algorithm. So uh, I've written some exercises here. I want you to think about these because these will force you to think about uh, separability and Boolean functions and hyperplane things as things. Think about how many mistakes the perceptron algorithm will make for n attributes. In order to answer this question, you need to discover what R and gamma would be for a disjunction. Similarly, you can ask the same question about K disjunctions. And this last thing is a difficult question. Find a sequence of examples that force the perceptron algorithm to make N mistakes for a K disjunction. So if you go beyond the separable new case, then it's a good news, bad news situation. The perceptron algorithm makes no assumption. So after, um, if the in the in the separable case, the perceptron, if after making a fixed number of mistakes, you're done. You don't need to see more data. You you can declare learning is successful. Unfortunately, the real world is not linearly separable. As a result, we cannot expect this. But this is just a guiding light. Uh, we can add more features. We can try to be more linearly separable, or we can think of average. So what you need to know, as far as this unit is concerned, is you need to know what the perceptron mistake bound is. And you should be able to prove it and you should be able to come up with, uh, understand what it means at an intuitive level. And I want you to kind of revisit this lecture, work out, work out the proof on your own to get a sense of how the proof works. It's a, uh, if you spend some time thinking about it, it is uh, somewhat intuitive. To wrap up the perceptron lecture, it's an online learning algorithm. It's very widely used, easy to implement. The batch version is one that's uh, usually implemented. It involves making additive updates to weights, essentially adding things to the weights. 
There's a neat geometric interpretation to what the update is. It comes with a mistake bound uh, guarantee. And there are practical variants that you should be uh, comfortable with. You should be able to implement the algorithm, you should be able to implement its variants, and also pr prove the mistake bound here. So we are out of time. There's one question. I'll, if it's a quick one, I'll try to answer it. Um, in the homework, the best hyperparameters are sensitive to randomness. How will I grade it? Uh, we will look for um, we we will look more for the accuracy than the right hyperparameters, and uh, minor changes don't matter. We will essentially look at what the average of the class is um, and make sure if you are too far off from that, it should be a problem. But really, the uh, accuracy and the uh, cross-validation accuracy and thus things matter more than the right performance thing. When will homework two be graded? Uh, well, first of all, homework one has to be graded. Um, we, we are in the process of grading homework one. Uh, we may not release the grades right now simply because uh, there are several students in class uh, who have a medical extension for various reasons. So uh, uh, it, it will take a little, uh, we have to kind of, uh, be respectful of their time. So we'll have to, we'll be releasing the grade a little bit later. Okay, I, we are a minute over time. So I would like to stop. I have office hours uh, starting in 15 minutes. Uh, if you have more questions, please come to office hours and we'll continue the conversation. Thanks.